Hello, it's Eric Becker, author of Candida Crusher. Thank you for tuning in to this YouTube video today. Today I'd like to talk to you a bit about Candida yeast infections. So what is Candida? What are Candida yeast infections? Well, Candida is a type of fungus. It's a basically a type of yeast. It is quite common for these yeasts to appear and grow inside people's bodies as well as on, their, on the surface of their body. Candida is commonly found in the gastrointestinal tract of people and also in the vaginal area of women. It can also be found in the throat, in the mouth and on the skin surfaces of people. It can become quite a problem when it really becomes an invasive infection and particularly in those which have got a compromised immune system it can be a real problem. So as I mentioned, it's a normally occurring yeast, inhabits the gastrointestinal tract of more than 90% of people. It's commonly kept in check uh, by bacteria, uh, beneficial bacteria and other beneficial yeasts. It can migrate quite easily from the vaginal area in women, uh, from, the, uh, from the rectal area uh, into the vaginal area and cause vaginal thrush. Uh, this is quite a common occurrence with many women. And the other overgrowth can also affect men, women as well as children. This condition can underpin many different chronic illnesses. It's frequently misdiagnosed by many people in the healthcare profession. It's commonly misdiagnosed, for example, as irritable bowel syndrome and even inflammatory bowel syndrome by lots of practitioners. One of the leading causes, as you're going to see in this presentation, is antibiotics. Uh, Low-grade stress in particular, chronic ongoing stress is often one of the big causes of a yeast infection. But so are diets which can be uh, laden in sugar and yeasts. So here you can actually see a picture of Candida, uh, the, the particular form. You can see the little buds here that can break off and grow into new yeasts. So Candida is quite an amazing organism with how it can reproduce and spread through the body. And it can evade detection by the immune system. It's very clever how it can mutate and change and grow and evade uh, destruction by immune system. So what are some of the main causes of a candida yeast infection? Well, these are the main 11 causes and you can also see another YouTube video on this particular uh, slide here. Um, antibiotic drugs are one of the leading causes of yeast infection. Uh, since the advent of antibiotics, there's been a very big increase in yeast infections uh, in, in people right across the board. Antibiotics in meat uh, is quite incredible how much antibiotics are used in poultry, for example. Uh, many thousands of kgs, kilograms of antibiotics are, are used every year in America and many countries across the world in the food chain, uh, as well as pharmaceutical drugs, antibiotics found in foods are big causes of yeast infections because they kill beneficial bacteria and allow yeast to thrive. Underlying uh, immune deficiency. So some people actually are born with immune weaknesses which can predispose them to a yeast infection. Steroid drugs or other pharmaceutical drugs can undermine a person's health and be a causative factor. Alcohol is a huge cause of yeast infections uh, men who drink, for example, beer regularly uh, and, and women or men who drink wine or beer uh, can be particularly prone to yeast infections, particularly those who are under stress, take antibiotics, uh, you know, uh, consume reasonable amounts of alcohol. You don't have to be a big drinker to get a yeast infection, uh, but maintaining regular alcohol consumption along with sweet foods and breads uh, and candies, chocolates, these things can all predispose you to a yeast infection. Candida friendly diets, for example, are diets high in soda drinks, uh, ice cream, uh, bagels, donuts, uh, packaged cereals, uh, jelly or jello, uh, ice creams, uh, takeaway food, all these sorts of diets can contribute to a candida yeast infection. Stress can be a huge causative factor. Stress actually can cause uh, a depletion of the hormone cortisol long term and cortisol is a very important steroid hormone produced by the adrenal gland which is a very powerful effect on creating a strong immune presence in the body. So with chronic ongoing stress, 
we can commonly find a person has an increased susceptibility to a yeast infection. Exposure to toxins, chemicals, heavy metals, for example, uh, mercury fillings have been linked uh, with, with the liberation of methylmercury in the mouth. There are some experts argue that there are, there's no association with yeast infection, but many other experts believe there is a clear cut association with methylmercury uh, and yeast infection. Diabetes, of course, people with particularly uh, type 2 diabetes will have elevated blood sugar levels, which can make a person more prone to having a yeast infection uh, as they maintain, you know, unchecked levels of, of blood sugar. It makes it easier for candida to grow. And of course, they urinate out large amounts of, uh, of sugar, and it can cause all sorts of yeast problems, uh, you know, in, in, that, in that part of the body. Chlorinated water has been implicated. Uh, chlorine can be antibacterial and allow yeast to thrive. And of course, mold exposure. We find in New Zealand and, and many other temperate uh, zones where people use a lot of heating inside that mold can be a big uh, causative factor and really uh, help to increase yeast infection in many people. So what are some of the signs, typical signs and symptoms of yeast infection? Well, you can read them here and you can also look at yeastinfection.org. I've got quite a few pages up on that website showing you the common signs and symptoms and the less common signs and symptoms. But these are the common ones you'll find with well, digestive problems like bloating and gas, food allergies, a vaginal thrush, uh, you're going to have mood disorders, a poor memory, poor concentration. Brain fog is a, is a key symptom we find quite a lot. Tired and malaise. Uh, toenail fungus and tinea, athlete's foot, urinary uh, candida manifestations, menstrual problems, libido issues, uh, painful muscles and joints, constipation, diarrhea are very common symptoms, uh, many sorts of uh, respiratory uh, allergies and issues, sinusitis, hay fever, persistent cough, phlegm, uh, even heart arrhythmias have been linked with yeast infections. And poor nails and skin are typical signs and symptoms. Uh, uh, lesser common ones can be headaches, but I see them quite a bit too in people with chronic infections. So candida can affect your body in multiple ways. Here you can see a typical uh, concern here with the feet. Athlete's foot here, very common with people. And toenails can look quite distorted and, and quite terrible. Uh, libido can be of course affected because when a woman has vaginal thrush or a guy has jock itch, it can really undermine the ability for per people to be intimate in their relationships. Uh, skin manifestations, very, very common with yeast infection and commonly misdiagnosed as being psoriasis or another kind of a skin condition. Uh, anxiety, depression, lots of stress people can get with this condition. Uh, lots of bloating and gas, we commonly see this with people. Lots of burping, lots of farting. Very common with beer drinkers and ice cream eaters and people who crave sweets. They get a lot of fermentation dysbiosis, so poor bacteria and yeast will thrive in this whole gut area. Here we've got periorbital uh, uh, around the mouth, uh, kind of a rash, like this could be easily misdiagnosed as being dermatitis but a skin scraping and culture will soon reveal that it is indeed a yeast infection. Here we have a gentleman with uh, probably a sinus headache, not feeling good at all, maybe taking pain relief, probably not knowing that he's probably got an aspergillus or a yeast kind of infection there in the maxillary sinus or in the frontal sinus. A very common manifestation of yeast infection is a, a sinus infection. Uh, here we have a lady with a skin rash of the hand uh, another uh, yeast kind of infection. Here we have a gentleman who's coughing. Uh, it's common to have mucus and phlegm and post-nasal drip with yeast infection. And of course, uh, uh, stomach cramps, bowel issues, gas, constipation, diarrhea, bloating, uh, pain in the joints, the small joints. Candida can cause lots of low-grade inflammations in the body. Uh, it can cause a lot of pain. You can see particularly common here to have pain on the left side, lower down in the abdominal region. The, the uh, descending colon and sigmoid colon are key areas I find where uh, people will often have issues. It can commonly be misdiagnosed as constipation uh, or, or bowel pockets, diverticulitis, when in fact it can be a yeast infection. 
uh, common of the bell. Uh, these are some quite awful toenails that I see from time to time in people. Uh, patients sometimes use drugs like Lamisil, but tea tree oil will be found quite effective in this case. And here we have a typical case of jock itch. I see jock itch in many males. Uh, here we have a psoriatic lesion. Uh, I'm currently working on an ebook on psoriasis because I see psoriasis to be mainly a yeast infection. Uh, once I clear candida up in a psoriasis patient, the psoriasis disappears. I have verified this in, in well over 100 cases. So the common medical approach of candida infections, candida is generally undiagnosed. A proper stool testing is not really performed on these patients. Sometimes they have a urinary culture or smear test for thrush, but it's seen as a nuisance illness, as a sort of side effect from antibiotics. It's treated often as a local problem, and it's actually seen by many doctors as a female, uh, mainly as a female problem, not even as a men's uh, potential issue. And as I mentioned earlier, it's often incorrectly recognized as irritable bowel syndrome. So... Natural medicine, well, natural doctors aren't much different from conventional doctors, unfortunately, when it comes to chronic candida, because it's sometimes misdiagnosed by uh, natural medicine practitioners. And if it is diagnosed, it's not treated adequately. It's not given the respect that it deserves. I really believe this, and you can read this in my book, Candida Crusher, uh, that I talk that candida, when chronic, needs to be treated with a lot of respect. Um, blood testing can be performed to look at various antibodies in the blood to determine if there is an antibody production. Although I'm not really that keen on, uh, on antibody testing with candida, I believe that the comprehensive stool test um, is really the, the, the gold test to do in this case. If you want to really know about yeast, you can actually determine it microscopically, uh, you know, uh, visual analysis through a microscope, or it can be cultured. Urinary indican testing, uh, we're looking for a urine test to discover bad bacteria. And wherever there's loads of bad bacteria, we're generally going to find some element of yeast infection. So treatments are not sufficiently followed through. Uh, treatments are not prolonged or strong enough. Uh, it's seen as small intestinal bowel overgrowth or allergies, leaky gut syndrome, irritable bowel syndrome, inflammatory bowel syndrome, etc. Uh, many naturopaths a chiropractors and herbalists will diagnose candida as being gluten intolerant uh, or an allergy that the patient will have some sort of gluten issue. Not enough emphasis placed on stress and lifestyle and uh, it is there is a capability of curing a chronic yeast infection. I have no doubt I've helped many people overcome this condition. So conventional testing, these are the four general tests that a conventional doctor uh, will do if he or she does uh, deem candida to be a problem, uh, urinary culture or smear, conventional stool test for a narrow range of pathogens, uh, an antibody blood test and a gut fermentation test, uh, a particular blood test. But a functional medicine practitioner or a naturopath will be more interested to do the enzyme-linked uh, blood test here to determine various antibodies of candida such as IgM, IgA and IgG. These things may not mean to you much to you, all these terms I'm using, but I will certainly elaborate on these terms in other more comprehensive video uh, clips in time on the Candida Crusher YouTube channel. So the comprehensive stool test, I believe, is the best way to determine not just Candida, but a whole raft of other dysfunctions in the digestive system that many patients with Candida actually present with. So we can actually determine by what kind of uh, foods are broken down and passed out, uh, we determine these to be organic acids. Uh, uh, certain sugars, for example, will break down to certain organic acids, and we can determine by the level in the urine to what degree a patient will have a yeast infection. I find this simple test called Indican to be quite a good test to determine how good or poor the bacteria is. This can be done in-house. It takes five minutes in my clinic, and it's quite a good test in general to determine how poor the gut is functioning. So why do I like stool testing? Well, it's a non-invasive diagnostic test for assessing the gut. It gives me a very comprehensive picture of a patient's gastrointestinal function. 
I can determine from a few stool samples what the bacterial levels are like. Yeast can be cultured. We can discover parasites. Uh, we can look at various digestive markers, for example, amylase uh, or pancreatic uh, enzymes can be picked up. We can look at various absorption markers to see if the body actually is, is taking foods in to the system. Uh, there are various markers called metabolic markers and inflammation as well to see if there's any inflammatory responses going on in the gut. Again, I'll, I'll be talking more in depth with, about the stool test on other uh, YouTube videos. One point I would like to bring up is the secretory IgA, which is the key immune marker in the stool test. And if we find it low, we'll often find this in conjunction with chronic yeast infection and also food allergies. Uh, low beneficial bacteria, uh, pharmaceutical drugs can often cause this, or viral infections. We can often find it with inflammatory bowel disease like colitis or Crohn's as well. And stress and low-grade uh, infections are commonly found. Patients who've had like past viral infections will often show low IgA. So IgA is made in the gut, in the small intestine. Uh, the, the body will make between 1 to 2 grams of this antibody per day. And one of the key roles is to grab hold of pathogens, you know, bugs and things like that, and to pull it out of the digestive system. So IgA is a very important uh, policeman, for want of a better word, uh, uh, you know, that will look after the integrity of the small intestine in particular. It's important to have good levels of IgA. When it's high, uh, we can certainly suspect inflammatory bowel disease if we find elevated inflammation markers. Uh, such as lysosine, but I'll discuss that in another video. So how do we boost IgA? Well, colostrum is quite good. Prebiotics, certain types of fibers. Uh, cane pepper, Saccharomyces boulardii, which is a beneficial yeast, which you can have with candida. Don't, con don't confuse this with yeast infect with candida yeast infection. Reducing elevated cortisol when a person is stressed is very important to increase IgA. So let's look at some of the drugs that are commonly used with the yeast infection. Nystatin, uh, named after New York State. Uh, this drug was discovered by two women quite a few years ago. I believe it was in the 1950s or 60s this drug was discovered. It's a widely promoted drug by Dr. William Crook in his book, The Yeast Connection, as one of the best antifungals. Um, it's not absorbed by the gastrointestinal tract, so the body will pass it out. And it, it interferes with uh, the cells of candida, helps to destroy them. Um, it can cause quite severe reactions. I've had many patients through Skype consultations that have told me that after taking nystatin, they got very ill indeed. I developed quite a strong reaction to nystatin when I took it myself. So I'm not a big fan of this particular drug. Uh, it can create quite strong side effects. And Dr. Crook said that side effects are good. Strong side effects mean strong kill. But... I'm not really keen for patients to have very powerful die-off reactions. I don't think it's really necessary with Candida to have these heroic treatments. The common drugs used by many doctors are the Zol drugs. Uh, fluconazole, for example, or Diflucan, is a very common drug that's used for vaginal thrush. Fungisone, uh, Amphotericin, I think it's called, uh, is a very powerful drug that's often used intravenously it's a very powerful drug that can create very strong side effects. But fluconazole can make you quite sick too. It can have uh, liver toxifying effects. So these drugs inhibit enzymes necessary uh, basically to convert something into yeast. So by taking a Zol drug, you're interfering really with the, with the, the, the function or the structure of the, the membrane of yeast. So you're destroying yeast. By inhibiting the reproduction and growth of it. It's not really recommended by me. The body can develop resistance to these drugs and also candida can change and mutate and be quite smart, become resistant to the Zol drugs, which means you need to take higher dosages and stronger drugs to get the same effect. So antibiotics are actually used for yeast infections because many Practitioners confuse candida with a bacterial infection will give an antibiotic. Uh, not a good idea. In medicine, many doctors are trained with infection. Just give antibiotics and a watch and wait approach. Give these drugs first and let's see what happens. But I don't really like this idea at all. 
antibiotics uh, uh, actually have a very powerful disturbing effect on the normal bacterial level of the large intestine and they create a proliferation of a lot of bad bacteria and then of course yeast will start thriving in the absence of good bacteria um, so it's not a good idea good ba bacteria bad bacteria get killed yeast start coming up so and as I mentioned earlier they're found widely in the food chain so my recommendations for foods are to eat clean meats preferably free from antibiotics so look at this graph here this is quite interesting this is um, in 2011 29 million 29.9 million pounds of antibiotics were sold for meat production in North America antibiotics to treat sick people in USA in 2011 7.7 .7 million pounds so let's say two pounds is a cage is a kilogram so you're looking at about three and a half million kilograms of antibiotics in one year in America which is phenomenal so this will give you some idea of, of reasons why we've got such a big problem with candida yeast infection in North America we've got a high amount of high fructose corn syrup consumption we've got lots of artificial sugars being consumed we've got lots of alcohol being consumed we've got lots of antibiotics being consumed we've got lots of low-grade stress so now you can understand how uh, yeast infections can be really rife and why 60 to 70 million Americans suffer from yeast infection. So stress reduction is very important and you'll read all about this in section 5 of chapter 7 of Candida Crusher. I've written extensively on stress. So acute short-term stress appears not to be as aggravating as long-term low-grade stress when it comes to gut problems. So there's a study that was done here in the American Journal of Gastroenterology uh, in 2000. So I won't go into these pathways here about interleukins, but uh, you can read more about this in my book. So I recommend the big cleanup in my book. So before people go on the, uh, the candida diet, I recommend really that they start with what I call a warm turkey approach. I, I slowly take them off junk food and caffeine. I do that over a 14 day period. I wind them down slowly. This minimizes aggravations and the typical healing responses people get and it improves uh, retention rate for a patient. This is mainly uh, something I would use for people who live a conventional Western lifestyle of buying supermarket foods, working a normal 40 hour a week job and being under low grade stress. So these are the three stages to my Candida Crusher diet approach. The meat, eggs, vegetables diet, the low allergy phase and the reintroduction phase. Again, you can read about this in more detail in chapter seven of Candida Crusher. I've written over 200 pages on diet. Uh, it's one of the most comprehensive Candida books you will find regarding uh, dietary advice. I go into many aspects of diet. So the Mevi diet um, I recommend because it is really an anti-Candida diet. It takes away the food source of the yeast. Yeast does not like to thrive on, on meats uh, blueberries, avocados, uh, green apples, yogurt, fresh vegetables and eggs. These seem to be key foods. Uh, they're, they're tasty foods. It's a good diet. You're not going to starve on this diet. You shouldn't lose a great amount of weight. So I recommend this approach generally for several weeks before we start introducing other foods. And then we look at a low allergy diet approach. So most people with chronic yeast infection will have a leaky gut syndrome, which you can read about, more about on yeastinfection.org. Many people with yeast infection have had a background of antibiotics or the oral contraceptive pill. They'll have poor levels of bacteria. They'll have all sorts of gastrointestinal distress. It's best for them to come off the key allergy foods. And the key food on this picture is cow's milk. I can remember doing a lot of work testing uh, young children in particular finding that nearly 60, nearly 70 percent of 350 stool, uh, food allergy tests I looked at, I found kids to have a problem with cow's milk. Bananas came back about 14 percent. Uh, pineapples come back reasonably high. Shellfish, uh, uh, things like prawns and crabs and lobsters will come back relatively uh, often. Uh, oranges, peanuts, uh, and bread and gluten is not as common as you think. The fingers always pointed at wheat and gluten, when in fact many people have bacterial and yeast problems that need clearing up before they start taking gluten out of their diet. I'm not a big fan of eliminating gluten from people's diets, to be honest. 
the reintroduction diet is something that you look at once you start feeling a lot better and a lot of your key signs and symptoms start disappearing. Now this may take four months, this may take six months, this may take 12 months, this may take two months. You can read about why there's such a swing in duration in my book. I explain this in more detail. But the foods that you need to reintroduce first are generally the foods um, which you discontinued, which gave you the least aggravation. So you're not going to really, for example, introduce cow's milk straight up. The foods you want to have the most back in your diet are the foods you've got to introduce the last because they're often the key foods that will have caused you an issue in the first place. Many people like alcohol, many people like cow's milk, uh, they like bread with lots of yeast in it. They like cakes or biscuits or coffees with sugars in them and milk. Lots of citrus, lots of bananas, uh, alcohol. So all these sort of you know items that we like to consume, you need to be careful on them and introduce them last. So let's look at some special foods. And you can read about this in section 4 of uh, chapter 7 of my book. I've got a great amount of detail about the special foods. A sauerkraut for example, uh, a very good uh, food to eat here because of the lactic acid content which encourages the proliferation of lactobacillus, good bacteria. Oregano uh, contains a component called the carvacrol, a uh, particular essential oil that's very powerfully antifungal. Coconut contains caprylic acid, very good antifungal medium chain triglyceride, so one tablespoon of coconut oil per day is a very good antifungal. Cloves uh, contain also a powerful essential oil, which is antifungal, so I usually recommend a consumption of one or two cloves per day. Yogurt and kefir, uh, these are very good foods uh, that, that you can have. Um, foods with cultures in them, simple to make. I've done video, uh, you know, YouTube clips on these. You can look more about the benefits of yogurt and kefir. The Allium family, foods high in sulfur, good cleansing, detoxifying foods and garlic in particular uh, is very antifungal. So various supplements I recommend probiotics, very important to take uh, for many different reasons. Probiotics are often uh, the beneficial bacteria are found lacking in many people with yeast infection and these levels need to be built up again. Digestive enzymes are critical. I've written extensively on reasons why people in particular need to supplement with uh, pancreatic enzymes to help break down uh, starches in particular and you'll you will realize that starches are a big problem when you read the GAPS diet book for example uh, starches are a big issue uh, with candida people need to break them down and uh, absorb them digest them and absorb them and excrete the waste properly and when enzymes help to break food down properly bacteria can start feeding on on the waste produced as a consequence of digestion and form a very healthy digestive tract. So this can often hold the key for recovery for many people, particularly people with bloating, flatulence, constipation and diarrhea will benefit often from a well-placed enzyme in the diet. Antifungal, antimicrobial supplements are required by all candida patients. So these are the three key products you can read more about in my book. So leaky gut syndrome, I don't think we'll go in on this video too much about it, but it is a condition that many people with candida suffer from. They start developing problems with the small bowel, uh, breaches occur and imperfectly uh, broken down proteins in particular uh, can bypass in through the intestinal wall and affect the immune system and cause all sorts of immune responses. Leaky gut syndrome is a key thing with food allergies you'll find. Once we overcome this syndrome, your ability to consume an increasing amount of foods uh, you will find will, will certainly be satisfying for you. Many people with so-called gluten problems have got leaky gut syndrome, which needs fixing up. Once this membrane of the small bowel is repaired, gluten should not really be a problem for many of these people. I've helped hundreds of patients back into gluten that were told they could never eat wheat products again. So what are some symptoms of leaky gut? Well, abdominal pain. These sensations of pain on the left or right hand side. Bloating, constipation, gas is a big one. A heartburn, brain fog, mood swings, nervousness, 
poor memory, wheezing, shortness of breath. You may recognize some of these things if you've got candida. And once you clear this leaky gut up, you won't suffer so much from these problems anymore. So here we can actually see a picture of these tiny things called microvilli. You can actually see here the lymphatic system running up through each microvilli and the blood vessels running around it. And here you can actually see the cells lining uh, this area here. So here's a picture here again of the villi. Okay, these tiny little villi. And we've got this tiny little area around it called the brush border. So these are tiny little hair-like projections with mucus that sits in there. Now in this area here, the secretory IgA uh, is king in this area here. So this is an area that we want to build up is the health of these cells lining these villi. And once we build these, health, these cells up nice and plump and fat, uh, they can do their job of absorbing nutrients uh, inside the, 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 the lumen of the gut in the digestive area. We'll talk more about this on another video. So, a couple of steps to healing the leaky gut. You need to give up alcohol for three months. It's realistic. If you can't stop drinking alcohol for this period of time, you need to turn this video off and go and look elsewhere for you know, some type of a quick fix, which is probably going to be full of rubbish anyway, nonsense, because alcohol, if you can't give it up with gut problems, I can't help you. I'm sorry. You know, my book wasn't for somebody like you. Most people who are serious about getting well with candida have got no issues about entirely stopping alcohol for a minimum of three months. You have to stop using non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. So certain types of medications like aspirin, and Tylenol, paracetamol, uh, uh, ibuprofen, you've got to get rid of these drugs. These drugs wreck gut function. Don't believe me? Go to Dr. Google and have a good look around and you'll see that what I'm saying is correct. Non-steroidal drugs destroy digestive function. A stool test for parasites, yeast or bacteria. You can contact me uh, if you want at eric at naturopath.co.nz uh, or NZ for those people living in Australia or New Zealand. So eric, E-R-I-C, at naturopath, N-A-T-U-R-O-P-A-T-H, naturopath.co.nz and I can give you, uh, you know, some more information and pricing on stool testing. This is a test I recommend people have who've got chronic problems. Anti-inflammatory diet is a key thing for people uh, with leaky gut. So no sugar. Watch out for white flour in particular. Uh, not because I'm against gluten. It's because these foods may really play up with leaky gut. And to heal it, we need to get your diet tidied up. You need to watch out for lots of meat with fat in it, uh, vegetable oils. I prefer uh, extra virgin olive oil, uh, fruits and vegetables, and usually white meats like uh, organic chicken uh, or fresh fish is, is a good approach. And there's a few dietary supplements you can use as well. Uh, L-glutamine in particular um, is a good amino acid to help heal the leaky gut. But if you suffer from high anxiety, you probably want to avoid glutamine because glutamine can turn into glutamate uh, converts to glutamate and it can cause problems with people with high anxiety. So malabsorption and maldigestion are things we've sort of spoken about and they're common in people with, with candida and leaky gut syndrome uh, conditions. This is where a lot of digestive pains will come from and bloating and gas uh, and, and, and constipation, diarrhea. Uh, also brain fog is quite common in these people. These things tend to clear up once we start eradicating candida. Irritable bowel syndrome is what I call a garbage can diagnosis. It tends to be where we lump people into when we don't know what the heck is wrong with them. But IBS is a, another term I see commonly in people with low-grade chronic stress and also with food allergies. And irritable bowel syndrome uh, is a condition that will generally clear up to a remarkable degree once we get rid of the bad bacteria and we reduce candida to low levels. Here's a picture of a patient's uh, fingernails you can see here with the white flecks uh, on the nails and um, many patients who think they're getting a heart attack in fact have heartburn and low uh, levels of stomach acid which we call hypochlorhydria which can be easily fixed up with the digestive enzyme. So flaky nails, uh, dry nails, uh, hair that, you know, that lacks luster, these things often uh, respond well to hypochlorhydria. 
You also need good functioning stomach to convert pancreatic enzymes from their inactive form to their active form. And remember we mentioned that pancreatic enzymes are very important to break starches down so you don't end up pushing partially broken starches into the small bowel to create lots of bad bacterial you know, areas for them to grow on. We don't pr uh, produce lots of gas and bloating and bowel issues further downstream. The better things work upstream, the better things work downstream in the gut. So if you've got any questions, you can email me at info yeastinfection.org. So again, my name is Eric Backer. I've been in practice for 25 years now and treated uh, over 15,000 cases of candida yeast infection. This is my book, Candida Crusher. Uh, you, can, uh, you can certainly have a good look at this book and if you're interested, purchase it. It's only 47 US dollars. It's taken me three years to write this book. Uh, I've been told by many uh, practitioners who have a copy that it's one of the best books they've seen on yeast infection. Um, you can also do my comprehensive online yeast infection evaluation here by clicking on this link and uh, YouTube, a YouTube channel. Um, we've, can, we've got um, quite a few videos I've uploaded with many more to come. So I hope you found this uh, video informative and it's answered some of your questions about yeast infection. Uh, I do welcome your questions and if you have got a chronic yeast infection uh, you can always uh, consult with me through Skype. I have patients now in over 30 countries. Uh, you can read a lot more information on my yeastinfection.org site. I've got some of the best articles on the internet regarding candida yeast infections. I've got my comprehensive book YouTube channel and the uh, yeast evaluation test. So I welcome you to use these resources. They're all at your disposal. And uh, thank you for your time and consideration.